Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, the meditations in all our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our strength and redeemer. Amen. I'm the kind of person who keeps his doors locked. My house, my car, even in the driveway of my parents' house at Rossmore, a very safe, gated retirement community, I lock my car. I don't have anything in my car. I have no idea what I think somebody might be after, but I lock it. The parsonage was broken into a few years ago, so I locked the doors there. Our house in Princeton was broken into some years back, and the person came up through the basement, so not only do I lock the outside doors, I even lock the basement doors in my own house. I have a very good friend who is a pastor, and one Sunday morning someone walked into the church, walked into the church office, and walked off with, with his computer. So I lock the church office door while we're in here. Many of us keep our doors locked. And not just to our home, our work, or, or our car. We keep doors locked to our lives as well. Because something out there makes us afraid. On the evening of that first Easter, ten of the eleven disciples were huddled together behind a locked door. What were they afraid of, I wonder? Maybe they were afraid that those who had killed Jesus would come looking for them as well. Maybe. But I think the fear went deeper than that. And I wonder if they didn't want to face those who knew they had failed Jesus. Those who knew that they had denied Jesus, had failed to stand with Jesus, how at the end they had left him to die alone. Maybe the real reason the disciples waited behind locked doors was that they were simply ashamed. We know what that feels like. We keep our hearts locked up because we know the truth about ourselves. And the truth is that we are not the people we want to be, not even the people we pretend to be to the outside world. Garrison Keeler of Prairie Home Companion fame said, we have a backstage view of ourselves. We let the audience see only the neatly arranged and appropriately lit stage with makeup on and hair in place, but behind the curtain all kinds of things are lying cluttered around, old failures, Old wounds, guilt, shame. When our fantasies of who we would like to be or who we want others to think we are comes face to face with the backstage reality of who we are, we shut the doors to our lives. And there is nothing more crippling to the soul than the hard work it takes to pretend we are what we are not. We lock more and more doors, sealing off more and more rooms of our heart to prevent our true selves from being discovered. We think we are keeping the world out, but in reality we are keeping ourselves locked in. At the heart of the gospel story is the good news that Jesus Christ comes looking for us. According to John... Jesus walks right through our locked doors to find us. And unlike what some others might tell us, Jesus is not standing outside the door waiting to be invited in. He's not there tap tapping his foot impatiently, checking his watch for us to make our move. He walks right through all our defenses, appearing suddenly in the rooms of our souls that are the most troubled. He shows us his wounds. He took on for our sake, wounds in his hands and his side that are the mark of our forgiveness and our healing and the marks of our restoration. And he says, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Now in ancient Palestine, peace be with you was more than a wish that you be kept from harm. A more accurate understanding is something like, may God give you every good thing. 
you're forgiven, he says. Peace is restored to your troubled soul, and because of what happened early that first Easter morning, God will give you every good thing. And what about Thomas? Doubting Thomas from our story. Was God to give him every good thing as well? Remember, Thomas wasn't there the first time Jesus appeared, and when he did return, I can imagine that after their experience with the risen Christ, all ten disciples turned to Thomas, and in perfect union, uh, unison would say, We have seen the Lord, Thomas. Repeating exactly what Mary had said to them that first morning, some hours earlier. And maybe, maybe Thomas's response should have been, All of you saw him at the same time? Well, that's good enough for me. Now I believe too. What do we do next? But that's not what he said. What he said was, unless I see, I will not believe. Which makes Thomas a, a stand-in for all of us who behind our locked doors sometimes say to ourselves, I'm not sure what or even if I believe. Maybe the most incredible thing about this story is that Jesus didn't cut Thomas out from his circle of followers, didn't say, sorry Thomas, you had your chance but you failed. Instead, he makes sure Thomas is included by coming back and appearing inside doors that Thomas thought were locked and shut and saying again, peace be with you. May God give you every good thing. And Thomas was given exactly what he needed. Jesus then says to Thomas, Have you believed because you have seen me? And looking over Thomas's shoulder, looks right into your heart and to mine, and he says, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. You and I weren't there. We didn't see him in the resurrected flesh or touch him or hear his words in person. You and I are separated from that little upstairs room by some 2,000 years and you and I still have our little locked doors. And yet Jesus intends for us to be included as well. Somehow he seems to be saying that there's room for doubt. There's room for question. You and I belong to a community from where the earliest days not everyone has believed all the time. We belong to a community that gathers every week on the first day of the week, not because we never doubt, because the promise that even our doubts will never separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. We belong to a community where sometimes we need others to believe for us. Because this may be a day when we're not really sure what we believe. We belong to a community where sometimes we need others to lift their voice in song because we frankly don't have the heart to sing this day. We belong to a community where sometimes we need others to pray for us because we literally do not have a prayer. And the community we belong to is church. It's church. William Sloan Coffin said that of course the church is a crutch. What makes you think you don't limp? Like he did with Thomas, Jesus intends for us to be included as well. And this morning's story makes clear that seeing is not superior to hearing. We are included as we hear the stories of our faith that are read from Scripture and are passed from one generation to the next, from a grandmother's knee to a child. We are included as we sing the hymns of the faith. We are included as we join together in the Lord's Supper, as we obey Jesus' command to take, eat, this is my body, drink from this, all of you. We're included. The words of Scripture are rooted in history, but they're more than history. They are theology, but they are more than theology. In the words we read and the bread and cup we share, Jesus is alive and present with the power to make us weep, rejoice, hope, believe, give thanks, act. 
and into our cluttered lives and locked doors full of old wounds, failures, guilt, and shame, Jesus walks right in past all our defenses, forgives us, and calls us to be a part of his kingdom. Catherine Patterson, she's the author of some really wonderful novels for young people, and uh, Bridge to Terabithia, The Young Gilly Hopkins, Jacob Have I Loved. If you don't know Catherine Patterson and you have kids that are moving to that age, think about looking at some of her books. And, and she said in an interview once that after speaking for an hour and a half with a group of teachers, she was asked by one young teacher if she had a word that he might take back to his students. And so in, in this interview, Catherine Patterson said she wanted to say that she'd been talking for an hour and a half and surely there was at least one word she could take back to her students. But she didn't say that. And what she said was this. I'm very biblically oriented. And I can write words for children and young people, but it is vitally important that the word, capital W, become flesh. Our society has become very good at telling children and young people that unless they can get their name in the newspaper or their picture in some magazine, they aren't worth very much. You are the word made flesh in the classroom. By your caring, your sharing, you're showing them how important they are right now. You become the word that I would like to share with them. You become the word made flesh to your students. For those of us who were not in that room 2,000 years ago, and did not see or hear the risen Lord firsthand, the word made flesh often comes in the form of another person. In other ways and at other times, we become that word for someone else. In what we do. And in what we say. In a thousand ways and more, Jesus intends us to be included, to be a part of things. To unlock the doors that keep us separated from one another. To be a part of Christ's life on church, to, uh, on earth. To be a part of the church so that the story continues to be told. So that future generations may be able to say with Mary, with the disciples, and with us that we have seen the Lord. In the flesh? No. In the stories of faith? In the meal? bread and cup that we share, very likely, in our life together as the community of faith, as the church, absolutely. And as Jesus said to Thomas in that room and said to those disciples, peace be with you, so does he say it to all. And in that spirit, let us greet one another with the peace of Christ.